Um, so my name is Rebecca Moore. I'm a medical oncologist based in Brisbane and I specialise in treating breast cancer. Um, and I guess I was inspired. I worked in uh, medical research before I did um, medicine. Um, so I always knew that it was an area that I, I wanted to, to get into because I really enjoy working with patients uh, through their cancer journey and that relationship you can build um, with, with patients throughout that time. Um, so I'm based at the MARTA Hospital uh, in Brisbane. Um, and I work both in the, the public and the private. So I also work at the Gold Coast University <coughs> Hospital and I'm involved in breast cancer research and tri clinical trials through the MARTA Medical Oncology uh, uh, Trials Group and also through BCT or breast cancer trials. Um, so these are my uh, declarations. Um, this is just general advice. Um, we do want to keep it informal. If you've got questions, throw your hands up. We can sort of take this wherever it goes. Um, so it's a little bit hard to predict exactly what you want to know from these sessions. So if you've got questions, I'm happy to answer anything. If you don't want to ask it in front of everyone, then by all means, come, I'm here till the end of the day. Come find me. We can have a chat and we can uh, go through any of your questions at, at that time. Um, so I am going to talk about a couple of medications that are just very new. Um, so, sorry, sorry. yep, it's metastatics next door. Um, but I'll see you in a, in a little while next door. Okay. <laughs> Um, so some of these medications aren't yet available as a standard of care treatments in, in Australia. Hopefully they're coming within the next sort of uh, one to two years, um, but where possible I've tried to highlight that. So some of them, they, they can be available on what we call compassionate access programs. So that's linking with um, some of the drug, drug companies. Some of them are only self-funded um, or available via clinical trials. Um, so this is what I'm trying to get through in the next 35 minutes, so, so we can have 10 minutes for questions at the end. We'll see how we go. So we'll go through breast cancer subtypes, um, some new developments for ER positive breast cancer, um, sequencing of treatment. So like Michelle was saying uh, just before, she had her treatment in the neoadjuvant setting. So exactly what does that mean? Um, and uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, um, and some, also some red flags and sort of tips to watch out for once you've done uh, all done your treatment. Um, so in terms of types of breast cancer, and I know that we do have some people here today with what we call non-invasive uh, breast disease, or, and that's uh, DCIS or LCIS. Um, and these changes in the breast really occur in a spectrum. Um, so these are what we call precancerous states. So if we leave them long enough, it's likely that they're going to develop in, into cancer down the track. I'm not de uh, discussing too much about those today because um, we really don't often need a lot of systemic treatment for, for those um, sort of uh, conditions. Um, you might have some adjuvant radiotherapy, but often people don't have to go on chemotherapy or endocrine therapy for those. Um, so we're mainly talking about invasive breast cancer, and that can be in two main forms. We've got invasive ductal carcinoma, or IDC. Sometimes that's written as invasive carcinoma NST, or no specific type. And that's about 70 to 80% of breast cancers. Uh, and then there's also invasive lobular cancer, uh, which is about 10 to 15% of, of breast cancers. Um, and they just um, are talking about exactly where in the breast the cancer started. Uh, so whether it started back in the lobules at the back of the breast or within the ducts. Um, in terms of breast cancer stage, there's a lot of information that we take into consideration when we're determining someone's cancer stage. Um, that can be the information from the biopsy, ultrasounds and mammograms. Uh, if you've had lymph nodes involved, then sometimes we'll do a staging scan. So that can be a PET CT um, or a CT and um, bone scan. And that's trying to work out whether that breast cancer is spread to somewhere else in the body, apart from the breast and, and the lymph nodes under the arms. Um, and we can try and sort of guesstimate that before an operation, or we can get that from um, after uh, at the time of operation. So what we call our path, uh, pathological um, stage. And in terms of early stage breast cancer, we're talking about stages one and two. Um, but in terms of 
uh, breast cancers where we do curative intent treatment. That also extends out to stage three breast cancer. So that can be things like locally advanced, uh, uh, advanced breast cancer um, or inflammatory breast cancer where the uh, skin over the breast is actually involved. Stage four refers to metastatic breast cancer. And that's uh, what we're discussing next door. Uh, but that's where the breast cancer is spread outside to involve other organs in the body. Um, so in terms of sub subtypes, you know, we're talking a bit of gobbledygook in terms of oncologists. There's three markers on every breast cancer cell that we always stain for and test for. And that's the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor. So there are female sex hormones and the HER2 protein. And some uh, cancers are HER2 overexpressed or HER2 high. Um, and based on those three uh, receptors, we split people up into different groups. And that's very important for me when I'm trying to work out what kind of treatment is gonna be beneficial for patients. So those three main groups are hormone positive or ER positive, HER2 negative, uh, HER2 positive, uh, which can be uh, hormone positive or her hormone negative and triple negative breast cancer where all of those three markers are actually not expressed so they're negative. Um, so for uh, hormone positive breast cancer the things that I look at to try and work out who needs extra treatment um, are lots of factors so the size of the tumour whether the lymph nodes are involved if it has spread somewhere outside of the breast and the lymph nodes the morphology or the type of cancer that's involved, um, the grade of the cancer, whether it's involving the little lymphatics that are go through the, that pe uh, particular area of breast tish tissue, um, things like patient's age, other medical um, troubles, so um, and also patient's wishes as well. Some ladies will come to see me and say, I never ever want chemotherapy. Uh, I think it's the worst thing in the world. And I say, okay, that's fine. What, what should we do from here? Um, and also sort of those tissue markers, uh, ERPR, HER2, and something called the uh, CHI-67 or a proliferation index. Now, those things we've had for many, many years and we've used those to try and, I guess, work out uh, um, who we offer chemotherapy to um, from those factors. And your oncologist may have um, gone through something like a validated tool to try and help with that discussion. And that's something like the PREDICT uh, NHS um, website, uh, where we can try and estimate what is the risk of your breast cancer coming back after surgery? Uh, and what is the potential benefit therefore from systemic treatment as well? So chemotherapy and hormone therapy. Um, and generally, um, if someone's got what we call high risk features, so if they're lymph node positive, sorry, that should be hormone receptor negative, um, a high grade, so grade three, a large size, so great, a tumor greater than five centimeters, HER2 positive, um, or younger patients, then often we're sort of more tending towards uh, more aggressive uh, treatments. Um, things that um, I guess you want to sort of ask your oncologist when you're, when you're meeting them is what's, we're trying to work out what that risk of cancer coming back is and therefore what's the potential benefit from additional treatments. And ultimately, um, is the risk worth the, worth the benefit from side effects? Now, something that has been a little bit in the news and um, has come around in the last sort of two years, uh, a whole lot of these assays uh, which can give us additional information in uh, ER positive patients, um, except they're very, very expensive and they're not on our um, PBS just yet. So these are assays called Oncotype DX or Mamaprint, and they cost between $3,000 to $6,000. So in some ladies, in some areas in Australia, um, these are being used, but patients have to self-fund this test. Um, and what it's really looking at is, um, can we safely spare some patients the side effects of chemotherapy? Um, because these can often identify um, patients that will probably do just as well from endocrine therapy alone and don't need chemotherapy. 
So in those of you who may have gone through chemotherapy, um, you know, if there was something that could tell you that you didn't need it um, and give you that confidence that you're making the right decision, then that can be um, useful. Um, but so hopefully these are things that we'll start to see in the next couple of years. Um, I do mention them because in some areas of the world, this is really standard of care for ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer after an operation using these tests. Um, the two that I've just highlighted there, Oncotype DX and Mammoprint, uh, the tissue from the surgery has to be sent off to overseas. Uh, it takes about uh, between three and four weeks to get an answer back. Um, and in ladies who are premenopausal um, and have node negative breast cancer, that might be one uh, area where I might consider talking to them about this test. Uh, or in ladies that have gone through menopause and are either node negative or have one to three lymph nodes involved. Uh, in ladies who are premenopausal and have nodes involved, we, we know that really most of them will get benefit from chemotherapy. And anyone that has more than four lymph nodes involved, then I'm strongly thinking about chemotherapy if they're well enough to have it. Um, so we have mentioned a little bit about um, adjuvant endocrine therapy. And the role for this is really well established. So we've been using this for you know, over 30 years. Um, and it's, it's hormone blocking therapy. So we're trying to decrease the levels of estrogen and progesterone in the system in these ladies. Um, and we can use, uh, do that via a number of different mechanisms or, or different tablets. So um, these are uh, mainly uh, oral therapies. So um, in premenopausal ladies, our mainstay of treatment is tamoxifen. It's one tablet, one time a day, and we usually recommend that for about 10 years. Um, in postmenopausal uh, ladies, then we will often use an aromatase inhibitor. And when we were talking about all those nasty side effects in terms of hot flushes, vaginal dryness, these are usually our culprits. Uh, this can include letrozole, anastrozole, exemestane. Um, in some higher risk uh, younger ladies, I will consider using an injection to turn off the ovaries so I can use one of the aromatase inhibitors because they're slightly more effective. Uh, and we generally recommend treatment for sort of five to 10 years. So it is the long haul. Uh, just to talk about some of those side effects quickly. Um, so with tamoxifen, hot flushes, vaginal discharge, mood disturbance, uh, rarely there is a slightly increased uh, risk of blood clots and a very small increased risk of uh, uterine cancer. Um, in aromatase inhibitors, hot flushes, joint pain and stiffness, uh, again, vaginal dryness, decreased libido, osteoporosis, fractures, mood disturbance, increased cholesterol and hair thinning. So these are all things that uh, you probably know about. Um, and I always tell my patients that if I don't know how you're feeling and what you're experienced, I can't help. Um, so I do encourage my patients to tell me if they've got vaginal dryness and I've got some slides that I've just added at the end so we can have that conversation about sex um, and what you can do to try and help that. Um, so with tamoxifen, we do know that 10 years is better than five. Uh, sorry, I've replicated things there, but an extra, there is an extra small benefit, um, but it comes at the cost of you know, the, those clots and potential um, endometrial cancer, but that risk is very, very small. Um, with the aromatase inhibitors, we do know that seven to 10 years is better than five. Um, there is an extra 4% uh, re uh, reduction in the risk of cancer recurrence. Um, but for most ladies, about seven years of an AI is enough if you've got average risk. Um, and that it, really the main thing that we're sort of offsetting there is that risk of developing osteoporosis or fractures. So that might be why your oncologist is talking about bone mineral density studies every one to two years. Um, sometimes we think about giving bisphosphonates, which are medications that help strengthen the bones as well. And they do have a, a benefit in terms of decreasing the, the risk of the breast cancer coming back. Um, so very quickly in one slide, um, manage, uh, managing the side effects of uh, these hormone blocking tablets. 
Um, there are things that we can do. Uh, BCNA has done some wonderful talks about um, uh, managing the side effects of uh, AIs and tamoxifen, and I encourage you to go and have a look at that. Um, and if we get time, I'll try and come back to this at, at the end. Um, something that's new in uh, ER positive breast cancer is uh, one of these medications called abemacyclib, which is a CDK46 inhibitor. Um, and this is for high risk ER positive uh, breast cancer. Um, so, and this is a study that, a big study that had been uh, done uh, in ladies that had at least four lymph nodes involved and it's, um, or one to three lymph nodes and some other high risk features. And it's talking about adding this tablet therapy to their standard endocrine therapy for a period of two years. Um, and then they continue on with their endocrine therapy afterwards. And it did um, give an additional um, chance of being alive at the three year mark for these high risk ladies um, of a 5% um, increased chance um, of being alive. But um, this medication is funded in the metastatic setting or advanced setting. It's not yet prime time for, um, uh, for the adjuvant setting just yet, um, but there is a compassionate access program um, where, where the drug company will give it to uh, patients for free for a certain number of patients. Um, so uh, it's something to talk to you about your oncologist or talk to your oncologist about. Um, if you've just been diagnosed and you do fit that sort of high risk sort of cohort. Um, so another thing that we've really changed in, in recent years um, is moving the sequence of our therapy for early stage breast cancer. So um, historically, we always went with surgery first. So you met the breast surgeon, you had your surgery, they had that tumour or lymph nodes taken out. Um, and then if you needed extra chemotherapy or radiotherapy or these hormone blocking tablets, we did it after surgery. Now we've moved that a little bit. And so with more and more ladies, we're giving uh, chemotherapy first. Um, and then they have five to six months worth of uh, chemotherapy plus or minus targeted therapy and then have their operations. They're still the same. And I guess the, the biggest reason I give chemotherapy is that it decreases the chance of the breast cancer returning. Um, so even if there's nothing that we can see on a scan to show there's been a cancer cell that's flicked off somewhere in the body, um, the chemotherapy can, if there has been one cell that's sort of taken up residence somewhere else, chemotherapy is aiming to mop that up. It's sort of like a, a bit of an insurance policy after your operation. Um, but uh, we get some extra benefits if we do that first. Um, so sometimes, especially in inflammatory breast cancer where that skin is involved, we can make inoperable tumours operable if they have a good response to the treatment. Uh, we can try and downstage the tumour, so it might mean that someone can have breast conserving surgery rather than mastectomy. Uh, it gives us some extra information so we can assess how effective the chemotherapy is. Um, and in patients where uh, we can personalise things, so if if all of the breast cancer cells haven't disappeared um, by the end of the chemotherapy, we can escalate those treatments and to uh, get a better outcome in, in those ladies if we need to. It also allows for extra time to plan surgical options. Uh, it can be very confronting if you've just been diagnosed with breast cancer and then talking to a surgeon about what kind of operation or reconstruction that you wanna have. This gives um, additional time to try and make that decision. Um, and it also allows for um, genetic testing results to come back. So um, if we're waiting for BRCA uh, testing to come back, uh, that can take between four and 12 weeks. Um, so that's too long um, before an operation if we're waiting for that. Um, if we're doing chemotherapy at the same time, we've got time for that result to come back. In ladies that do have a BRCA mutation, they may actually decide to have a mastectomy and a prophylactic mastectomy on the other side. Um, and it means they can get that operation all done at one time rather than going in, having an operation, finding out they've got a BRCA mutation, then having go, to go back to theatre a number of months later. Um, and I guess the biggest indication for neoadjuvant treatment is HER2 positive breast cancers and triple negative breast cancers. Um, so with uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, um, we give the treatment first and then we're looking at that tumour that gets removed at the time of surgery to try and assess the response. 
And we use terms like pathological complete response, which essentially means there's no live cancer cells in the tissue removed at the time of surgery. So this um, figure in um, B there um, shows a complete response. So all those little purple cells, they're all dead. We can see some scarring there, but there's no live cancer cells left. That's what we're hoping for. In these ladies, they will have had chemotherapy and trastuzumab, or what used to be known as Herceptin, and they can just continue on that Herceptin for a full 12 months. In some ladies, uh, we find that not all of those cancer cells have actually died at the time of surgery. Um, so there's still some more resistant cancer cells there. Um, and there's all those little purple cells that, that you can see. Um, and we say that they've got residual disease. And quite often when people come and see me, they're a bit confused by that term um, because they're saying, do I still have cancer left in the breast? Why are they saying it's residual? Um, and all it means is that in that lump that the surgeon has taken out, um, there's some cancer cells that are still alive in that section. It doesn't mean there's cancer cells that are left in the body, but that tumour is a little bit more resistant to treatment. So these are the ladies who would benefit from escalated treatment. So we can do better, give them a little bit stronger treatment. So if there was one of those cells that had flicked off, we can do better at mopping it up. Um, and that's by using something called trastuzumab and emtanzine or TDM1 uh, for instead of that Herceptin. So we use a medication which has a little bit of chemotherapy linked in with it to develop, uh, to give some additional targeted chemotherapy to any HER2 um, positive breast cancer cells that are left behind. Um, and in those ladies, it decreases the chance of their cancer coming back by 50% compared to just continuing with the trastuzumab. In the ladies that um, have had a complete response, they don't need extra treatment. They do just as well regardless. Um, so we can spare them the side effects of this extra um, drug. And that's available on, on the PBS. Sorry, this slide is a little bit busy, um, but this is sort of talking about um, that sequencing again, um, just in sort of picture form. Um, there is another, I guess, uh, regimen that occasionally we might use just down the body there, bottom there. Um, and that's using two HER2 targeted therapies, uh, which is a trastuzumab and pertuzumab in com uh, combining with just one chemotherapy drug. Uh, for about three months and then going to surgery. Now, pertuzumab is a medication that we've got available in the metastatic setting. Um, it's not available in the neoadjuvant setting, um, but some patients will choose to self-fund it. Uh, neoadjuvantly, it's about $6,000, so it is a lot um, to outlay, um, and especially if you're continuing it on after, after surgery. So we're not using that quite so much in Australia at the moment, but occasionally uh, overseas they, they do use that. Uh, triple negative breast cancer. How am I going for time? Sorry, I forgot to put my timer on. Ricky, you'll uh, 15 minutes. Awesome. <laughs> triple negative breast cancer. Uh, so uh, this is a cancer that's classified by what it doesn't have. Um, so those, it doesn't have any of those three main growth signals. Um, so ERPR and HER2, these are all negative and triple negative breast cancer. And it makes up about 15% of breast cancer diagnoses. Um, it tends to be faster growing. So it is more often sort of grade three or high grade. Often it will have a high proliferation index to, to show that it's growing really quickly, but not always. And there are a couple of different types of uh, triple negative breast cancer. So they're not all the same. Um, but in these cancers, chemotherapy can be really highly effective. Um, and in early stage disease, unlike, um, I guess, ER positive breast cancer, which can come back many, many years after that initial diagnosis, even out to a couple of decades, um, triple negative breast cancer uh, tends to recur most commonly within the first three years. And then it really drops off um, after the five years. So if it, if it is going to, it often comes back early. And after that five year mark, it's really unlikely for this type of breast cancer to, to come back. Um, so I'll often follow these ladies with triple negative breast cancer quite closely for the first three years. And then I'll send them back to, oh, no, that's not for me. Five minutes? Oh, yes, okay. Um, 
that's more about neoadjuvant uh, treatment. Um, Breast Cancer Trials does have a fantastic resource for this. So um, my neo guide is excellent. Hopefully, um, Sally, you know, will have been onto that if you needed to go through uh, neoadjuvant treatment. Um, getting to some exciting things in triple negative breast cancer. Um, and that's immunotherapy, uh, which tends to be a very sexy word in other types of cancers, but uh, breast cancer is really sort of lagged behind and immunotherapy doesn't, until now, hasn't really had much of a role to play in, in breast cancer. Um, and also for ladies with uh, a BRCA mutation, there is a medication called Olaparib, uh, which is also found to be helpful in, in these ladies. Um, so, um, so uh, in in people that do have a BRCA one or two mutation, um, there have been there's evidence to say that this tablet medication um, taken uh, twice a day for 12 months um, also increases um, outcomes. Uh, so there's an increased uh, an eight percent uh, increased chance of being alive at the three year mark from this tablet. Um, and um, it's not currently funded in Australia um, for um, early stage breast cancer. It's available for things like uh, ovarian cancer and hopefully we'll start to see it uh, soon as well. Uh, of course, with any of our treatments, there's side effects, nausea, fatigue, anemia, vomiting are just some of the ones for this, uh, for this um, tablet. Uh, so uh, what else can you do um, after you've got through all of your treatment uh, and um, exercise? So at the end, um, you know, your treatment doesn't stop with all the chemotherapy and radiation being done. Um, exercise, weight loss, minimising alcohol intake um, and really assessing all those lifestyle factors can actually um, decrease the chance of the breast cancer coming back as well. Um, I really do advocate for seeking out good quality resources, um, increasing your knowledge, getting to know your breast cancer nurses um, and empowering yourself in your own treatment. So um, that need for support doesn't end with stopping the chemotherapy or radiation, but a lot of those external supports step back. Um, so that's sometimes where BCNA and, and other sort of foundations can come into, um, you know, into play. Uh, Follow-up treatment um, and what to look look out for. So, usually um, annual breast cancer imaging with a mammogram and ultrasound. Um, being aware of and just reporting sort of red flag symptoms, uh, especially if they persist. So this isn't just something that's there for a day and then goes away. If it's there and it continues, uh, especially for more than a week, then it's something to seek some um, help and and uh, look into. So that can be lump swelling or skin changes, headaches, nausea, um, bone pain, abdominal pain, um, breathing troubles, cough, uh, persistent cough or chest pain, nausea, weight loss if you're not trying to lose weight, um, sometimes we uh, leg, uh, leg weakness, um, problems controlling bladder and bowel. Um, so they're all reasons that I'd go to your GP to get um, checked out. Um, there really is no evidence to support um, routine tumour markers or routine scans if you don't have any symptoms. So um, often that will just create a whole lot of anxiety. Um, so I don't advocate for that apart from that breast imaging of residual breast tissue. Uh, in summary, um, so it is really an exciting time for, for breast cancer. We are getting lots of new and effective treatments that are coming online uh, and we're trying to move to a more personalised type of treatment as well. So uh, we're realising that in some patients, more treatment is not necessarily better um, and sometimes there's better ways to assess a risk and modify treatments based on risk. So we're not exposing every patient to all our tre treatments if they don't need it but we're getting that benefit in those that, um, that do. Now, just one question that came from the talk before, um, and I added a couple of slides in quickly, yeah. um, is that you do need to, we do need to have that conversation about sex for our ladies who are on long-term endocrine therapy. It is very, very common, um, and it's something that's not talked about. So a lot of people, 
it will be affecting their quality of life and they don't feel confident enough to talk to their oncologist, talk to their GP. Um, it can have many uh, names, so things like vaginal dryness, vaginal atrophy. Uh, the technical name is something GSM, so genitourinary symptoms of menopause. Um, these symptoms do happen to ladies that aren't on endocrine therapy too. Um, and some of those symptoms can be uh, vaginal itching, pain, dryness, irritation, um, pain with sex, uh, decreased libido, uh, urinary frequency, dysuria, or inability to orgasm. And there are things that we can do about it. Um, so uh, what I'd usually recommend, uh, so you can go with the non-hormonal vaginal moisturizers, so things like Replens. Uh, it's a little bit like lip balm, you need to keep using it. Um, so, uh, and it works best if you're using it regularly. So at least three nights a week. Um, and um, lubricants for intercourse, um, they can be water-based, they can be silicone-based, they can be oil-based. Um, now that everything's online, you don't necessarily need to walk into your pharmacist and buy them over the counter or walk into a sex shop. Um, but you can get them over the, uh, online. So um, head to that BCNA website. You know, there's some talks in there as well, uh, which can point you into the right direction. And they really can help. Um, things like dilators um, to stretch and relax the vaginal muscles. Um, my patients haven't had a great deal of luck with that. Um, there's sort of pelvic floor physios and things that you can go to as well. Um, if all of that doesn't work, um, you can consider switching um, back from an AI to tamoxifen, which tends to have less of these symptoms associated with it. Um, but that changing can really have at least three months to take effect. So, you know, in those patients where it's just driving them crazy, they're thinking about stopping their, their hormone therapy, I'll often try and change back from, to tamoxifen and see whether that helps. Um, you can use um, low-dose vaginal estrogens, uh, which is sort of a topical application. Uh, if the symptoms are refractory, um, there's theoretically a lower risk in patients that are on tamoxifen than AI just because of how they work. Tamoxifen works on the receptor, um, but it, they're better with continual use because it sort of strengthens that vaginal um, tissue um, and decreases the chance of getting systemic absorption of those estrogens. So um, it's something that we can do things about. So head online, get some information about it. We can sort of do things that help.